All right, in this presentation, we're going to look at the introduction to acids and bases, part of grade 12 chemistry. So we'll jump right in. If you've done the equilibrium unit already, you're going to see connections in this new introductory uh, PowerPoint. So to begin with, let's look at properties, basic properties of acids and bases. These are sometimes called operational definitions because you could use them to identify an acid or base in practice in a lab setting. Uh, the first thing, <laughs> excuse me, the first thing we'll say about acids is actually something you wouldn't normally do in a lab setting. They taste sour. Um, acids include things like lemon and orange juice. So just imagine how those things would taste, and you would, I think, agree with that. They taste sour. They feel, initially at least, like water if you get them on your hands. A dilute acid doesn't uh, immediately start burning, but it'll just feel watery on your skin. A more concentrated acid pretty quickly will start to feel, will start to feel like it's burning, but initially it'll feel just like water. Acids make good electrolytes. That's a really important term. Make sure you pause the video and write a definition of electrolytes as well. An electrolyte is a substance which, in water, produces ions, and then that allows the water to conduct electricity. So again, it produces ions in water, and the resulting solution conducts electricity. At 25 degrees Celsius, the pH of an acid will be less than 7. Back in middle school or even as early as elementary school, you were probably introduced to the pH scale, but you probably didn't realize, though, that it's linked to temperatures. And we'll see later that's because there's an equilibrium constant involved connected to this. Again, back in elementary school or middle school, you probably used litmus paper to, uh, to uh, identify acids and bases. Litmus paper is just chromatography paper, filter paper, with the chemical called litmus soaked into it and allowed to dry. Litmus is an acid-base indicator. That's an important term, an indicator. Um, it has two different uh, colors. If you start with blue litmus paper in an acid, that's going to turn red or pink. And that's the test for an acid because it changes color at pH 7. A less common acid base indicator, but another one that we're going to use quite a bit actually in this unit, um, is called phenolphthalein. Phenolphthalein is colorless in acids, so it'll look just like water when placed into an acid. Properties of bases. Again, you would not taste a base in the lab, but uh, bases include things like soaps, and uh, you might have uh, tasted some soap at one point or another, perhaps when showering you got some soap in your mouth. Um, they taste bitter, kind of have a bitter taste in your mouth. Like soaps, they feel slippery on your skin, so you pretty much immediately know if you've got a base on your skin. If left there, a base will burn you um, like acids will. Strong bases, concentrated bases, are just as dangerous as concentrated acids. In a similar way, strong soaps can, can be harsh on the skin as well. Bases, like acids, will produce ions in water, and that makes them good electrolytes because the resulting solution conducts electricity. So acids and bases both produce ions, and the resulting solutions conduct. That's what makes them electrolytes. At 25 degrees Celsius, bases will have pH values greater than 7. If you start with pink or red litmus paper, um, they're going, it's going to turn blue if it's dipped into a base. And finally, phenolphthalein, the acid base indicator that we're going to use a lot in this unit, will turn pink in most bases. Technically, it turns pink at around pH 8.5 or 9, but um, for most bases that we'll encounter, it's going to be pink in color. All right, so you can pause the video if you need to to copy down the rest of those 
of items. We're going to look at two definitions for acids and two definitions for bases. The first definition was given by a Swedish chemist named Arrhenius. It's the broadest definition. It says that an acid is a substance which will produce hydrogen ions in water. So we know that acids produce ions. That's what makes them electrolytes. Um, acids actually produce hydrogen ions when they're dissolved in water. The chemical formula for acids, if you remember back to your grade 11 chemistry, almost always starts with a hydrogen in the formula. So HCl, HNO3, H2SO4. There's a few acids where the hydrogen is at the end of the formula, but most acids will have hydrogen at the beginning of their chemical formulas. Now, one problem with Arrhenius' definition is that it only refers to things dissolved in water. In our unit that we're about to embark on, we're going to primarily talk about solutions like that, but we'd like a better definition when it's not limited to water. And that's where the Bronsted-Lowry definition comes in. The Bronsted-Lowry definition, two different chemists came up with the same idea. They said that acids are substances which donate, that's a really important term, donate hydrogen ions to other substances. So notice there's no mention of water now. And notice that it gives you not just the idea that acids contain a hydrogen in their formula, but it gives you a sense of what acids actually do in a chemical reaction. Acids are going to be giving away hydrogen ions as we'll see in a moment, that is linked closely to the definition of bases that these two guys also provided. So the same two folks gave us definitions again, this time for bases. So Arrhenius says that bases will produce hydroxide ions when dissolved in water, OH minus the hydroxide ion. Bronsted-Lowry did not mention water again in their definition, and notice they remained focused on hydrogen ions. Whereas an acid was something that donates hydrogen ions, they defined bases as substances that accept hydrogen ions. So now you have a sense of what an acid-base reaction actually involves. The acid gives away hydrogen ions, and the base in the reaction will accept the hydrogen ions. So that'll let you identify an acid and base in a chemical reaction. So let's take a look at a typical acid-base reaction. And we're going to see in this reaction some conjugate acid-base pairs. The word conjugate simply implies a partner. So there's going to be an acid reacting with a base. And after the acid has donated hydrogen, it's going to be left with its conjugate. And when the base accepts a hydrogen, it'll produce a conjugate as well. So let's take a look. Pause the video if you need to, to write down this balanced chemical equation. Pay attention to the phases. The HF is an, is an aqueous acid, hydrofluoric acid, and it's placed into water. This is going to be a very, very common chemical reaction that we write. The acid ionizes in water, and so the water's phase is liquid. An equilibrium is established. Now, since HF is an acid, it's giving away hydrogen ions to the water. And so the product, the hydronium ion, H3O positive, is produced. That's a really, really important ion in this unit. Make sure you know its chemical formula and its name. I'm going to see if I can write it with my mouse here. So this is the hydronium ion, H-Y-D-R-O-N-I-U-M, hydronium cation. The HF, after donating its hydrogen ion, is left with the F- ion, fluoride. Now when you look at those four substances in the forward reaction, the HF is giving hydrogen to the water. So water is accepting a hydrogen from the HF. So in the forward reaction, the HF is behaving as an acid while the water is behaving as a base. If you read the reaction in reverse, the hydronium ion, H3O positive, 
is giving a hydrogen ion to the fluoride ion. So the products there in reverse are water and HF. Since the hydronium is giving away a hydrogen, it's going to be an acid, and the fluoride was going to be the base in accepting hydrogens. Here's another acid-base reaction. Let's see if you can pause the video and label the four substances in the equation as acids and bases based on donating and accepting hydrogen ions. So the sulfate anion, SO42 minus, has no hydrogens at all. So sulfate can't possibly be an acid. If you look at the right-hand side, sulfate has become HSO4 minus, which means that it accepted a hydrogen ion. Sulfate got the hydrogen ion from bicarbonate, which had the hydrogen to, to give away. So sulfate is accepting hydrogen, bicarbonate is giving away the hydrogen, sulfate is the base, and bicarbonate is an acid. Now after accepting the hydrogen, sulfate becomes HSO4 minus. And bicarbonate, after giving away the hydrogen ion, is left with just carbonate, CO3 2 minus. And that's where the conjugates come in. We can, we can connect an acid with its conjugate base, or a base with its conjugate acid. And I'm going to use little arrows to do that. So in the first reaction, HF was an acid. After it gives away hydrogen ions, it's left with its conjugate base, the fluoride ion. So we connect those two with an arrow. Similarly, the water was a base. After it accepted a hydrogen ion, it became hydronium. So the hydronium is the conjugate acid of water. Now, if you read the reaction backwards, you could argue that the hydronium is an acid, and after it gives away its hydrogen ion, water is its conjugate base. Similarly, fluoride is a base, and after accepting a hydrogen ion, the HF is its conjugate acid. So the word conjugate doesn't mean anything other than a partner. Okay? It doesn't mean that it's a special kind of acid or a special kind of base. It just means that we're identifying it as part of a pair. In the reaction below, sulfate was a base. After it accepts hydrogen ions, HSO4- minus is its conjugate acid. Bicarbonate HCO3- minus was an acid. After it gave away the hydrogen ion, carbonate CO3-2- minus was its conjugate base. We often talk about acids as being strong or weak, and it's important that you have a sense of what that actually means. Strong or weak does not mean anything about dangerous or not dangerous. We know that an acid, when placed in water, will ionize or dissociate and give away hydrogen ions. The balanced equation for hydrochloric acid ionizing in water is shown here. HCl reacts with the water. The HCl gives away the hydrogen ion to the water molecule, producing hydronium and chloride ions. Now, when you put HCl in the water like this, it turns out that HCl ionizes completely. Essentially, every HCl molecule that goes in the water donates hydrogen ions to the water, producing hydronium and chloride. And that means that in a bottle of hydrochloric acid, there actually won't be any HCl particles floating around in the water. Instead, every HCl particle will have become hydronium and chloride ions. So a strong acid is one that ionizes or dis dissociates, if you like, completely. Okay? It ionizes completely in water. Think about the significance of that if we were to draw an ice table under the equation. Whatever the starting concentration of the HCl was, it would lose all of that in the reaction because it ionizes completely. If it's a complete ionization, then the equilibrium constant for the reaction must be large. Now we're going to give the equilibrium constants for acid ionization reactions like this a special symbol. 
instead of Kc, the generic symbol for an equilibrium constant, we're going to call it Ka. And the A will simply remind us that it's for an acid ionizing in water. So Ka is the equilibrium constant for the acid reacting with water like we see in this equation above. Because the strong acid ionizes completely, they generally will make good electrolytes. Now it's possible theoretically that you could have a ac strong acid solution which is so dilute that it's actually not a very good electrolyte. Concentration is another factor. But generally speaking, for an acid of any moderate concentration, strong acids will be good electrolytes because they produce lots and lots of ions in the, <coughs> excuse me, in the water. If you like pictures instead of words, you can sketch what you see here. It takes the same ideas as the previous slide and communicates it with pictures. So a strong acid is shown in the first part of the picture, first the part of the diagram. We begin with an acid represented as HA, that's just a generic term for an acid, and this column here represents the undissociated HA, the unionized HA. If it's a strong acid, then that HA completely ionizes and becomes hydronium and A-, the conjugate base of the HA because of the one-to-one -one ratios in the reaction, those two substances end up having columns shown in blue here, the same height as the original HA column was. And notice that after dissociation, there is no more HA left. So the HA has completely ionized and become hydronium and A-. In the case of a weak acid, we start with the same amount of HA, but this time we imagine it's only going to partially dissociate. It only ionizes a little bit. So it produces some hydronium and some conjugate base, A-, minus, and those are again in a one-to-one -one ratio, so they're equal in concentration to each other. And then the HA column drops slightly, and it'll drop by an amount equal to the height of one of the blue columns. So the HA loses a little bit of acid, and that little bit produces hydronium and A-. Again, everything's in a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio from the balanced equation. There are, are a handful of common strong acids that you're going to encounter. Um, if you have a data booklet in front of you, it would be good to open it to page 8, which is a table of acid ionization constants. At the top of that page in your data booklet, you're going to see acids where the Ka values are said to be simply large. Those Ka values represent strong acids. So common strong acids include hydrochloric acid, HCl, nitric acid, HNO3, hydrobromic acid, HBr, hydroiodic acid, HI, and sulfuric acid, H2SO4. Now notice that the chloride ion, the nitrate anion, the bromide and the iodide, those all have charges of minus one. So because their charges are minus one, they end up forming acids with only one hydrogen each. Sulfate, on the other hand, SO4, has a charge of two minus. Because its charge is two minus, we need two hydrogen ions to balance that charge, so sulfuric acid is H2SO4. Now, even though it has two hydrogen ions, only the first of the two hydrogen ions itself in, in sulfuric acid dissociates or ionizes strongly. So it's going to dissociate into two steps, one of which will be a complete ionization, a strong dissociation. The second will be a weak ionization. There are a lot more common weak acids, so it's not really worthwhile memorizing these, but if you memorized those strong acid names and formulas, that'll help to uh, solve problems quickly later on. Again, on page 8 in your data booklet, most of the acids in that chart are weak acids, and you know that because their Ka values are not large. 
generally whenever you see a Ka value, it'll be less than 1, and then th that represents a weak acid. The smaller the Ka value, the weaker the acid is. So hydrofluoric acid, HF, has a Ka of 6.8 times 10 to the minus 4. That Ka value would represent the equilibrium constant for the reaction of HF with water, producing hydronium and fluoride ions. Acetic acid, the acid that's found in vinegar, CH3COOH, its Ka is smaller, 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. And again, that would represent the equilibrium constant for the reaction of acetic acid with water, producing hydronium ions and acetate. Now, when you see COOH in a formula like this, your organic chemistry kicks in, and you recognize that's a carboxylic acid. It's the H at the end of the molecule which gets donated. H's bonded to carbon, CH3, are never donated. We can talk more about that later in class. So the H bonded to oxygen is the one that's acidic. Nitrous acid, HNO2, and another common weak acid is benzoic acid. And again, we see the COOH, so that's a carboxylic acid. And it's this H at the end which would get donated. Can you take those four acids and number them in order of increasing strength? So which of them would be the weakest acid and ranked up to the strongest acid? To do that, what you want to do is start with the acid with the smallest Ka value. So the smallest one of these would be acetic acid, 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. And you want to move up to the acid with the largest Ka value. So put in order, that would be acetic acid is the weakest, followed by benzoic acid, followed by nitrous acid, and then of these four weak acids, hydrofluoric acid is the strongest one of them. Now let's not write the dissociation reaction for each of the acids, but why don't you do it, pause the video and do it for HF. And when you're done writing its equation, you can write the Ka expression for the reaction as well. So what you wanted to do is write the balanced equation showing HF reacting with water. The HF is aqueous and the water is liquid. It'll produce hydronium ions, H3O positive, and fluoride ions, F minus. Remember that when you lose a hydrogen, your charge goes down. So HF was neutral, the F will be minus one charge. If you gain a hydrogen, your charge goes up. So where water was neutral, the hydronium ion is plus one. The ions are aqueous in the reaction. When you write the Ka expression, you'll say this is just the equilibrium expression for that reaction. We remember that we leave out liquids and we leave out solids from equilibrium expressions. So the Ka would equal 6.8 times 10 to the minus 4, and that would equal the concentration of hydronium times the concentration of fluoride divided by the concentration of HF. This table just shows us uh, some information that you have in, on page 8 in your data booklet. Your table is a little different from this one. The Ka values may be slightly different as well. Ka values are usually measured values, so different textbooks will have slightly different values. We're going to use the Ka values in our data booklet unless they're given in a, in a problem that we're doing. All right, on this slide, see if you can pause the video, discuss with a neighbor, um, which of the two pictures, A or B, would represent a solution of a weak acid. They both show acids, HA, but one of them is for a weak acid, one of them is for a strong acid. So which is which? So we know that strong acids ionize completely in, in solution, so essentially every HA particle should be broken apart. Now in the top picture, we see a whole bunch of H positives and A minuses. Now if you're observant, there is one HA particle. 
but essentially all of the HAs are ionized in the top picture, so that would be the situation for a strong acid. Down below, it's the reverse. Most of the acid particles down below have not ionized. They're mostly in the HA form. Only one of the acid particles has ionized, producing hydrogen and A-. minus. Now in these pictures, water was not represented. In reality, the H positive ions would have been donated to water, so every H positive ion in the picture should really be drawn as a hydronium ion, H3O positive. Polyprotic acids. If you think of a hydrogen ion for a minute, imagine what its Bohr diagram would look like. A hydrogen atom, neutral, will typically have one proton as its nucleus and one electron orbiting the nucleus. If you've become a hydrogen ion, H positive, you've lost your one electron, and that would leave behind just a proton. So a polyprotic acid is an acid that has more than one hydrogen ion, more than one proton to donate. If you are a monoprotic acid, the word prefix mono, of course, means one. So if you're a monoprotic acid, you're going to be an acid with only one hydrogen ion. So HF, HCl, HNO3 are all monoprotic acids. If you have more than one hydrogen, you're a polyprotic acid. Now, technically, if you've got two hydrogen ions, like H2SO4 or H2CO3, we can be more precise and call you a diprotic acid. Likewise, if you have three hydrogen ions, H3PO4, we can call you a triprotic acid. So diprotic and triprotic acids are also more generally called polyprotic acids. Now besides vocabulary, there's another really important thing to know about polyprotic acids. When they are put into water, they do not dissociate, they do not ionize um, in one step completely. Instead, they go through a series of steps. So we say they dissociate in a stepwise fashion. To illustrate that, let's consider sulfuric acid H2SO4. It'll dissociate in two steps. It has two hydrogen ions. In the first step, it'll give one hydrogen ion to water. And in the second step, it'll give away its second hydrogen ion. So the first step of its ionization will look like this. H2SO4 reacts with water and I've left out the phases here because I'm getting a little bit lazy. The H2SO4 is aqueous and the water is liquid, and that'll produce hydronium and HSO4 minus the bisulfate ion. Hydrogen sulfate is its proper name. Ions are always aqueous like this, and then the water is liquid, the H2SO4 is aqueous. Now notice that the conjugate base in this reaction, HSO4 minus, still has a hydrogen ion to give away. So although in this reaction HSO4- is the conjugate base of the H2SO4, it's going to, in a second step, act as an acid. So here's the HSO4- reacting with water, and it gives away its hydrogen ion. That's why it's acting again now as an acid. And it's going to produce more hydronium, H3O positive, and then sulfate, SO4 2 minus. We know that's the final step because sulfate has no more hydrogens to donate, so we're done. So H2SO4 ends up having two steps in its ionization. If you look up H2SO4 on your, in your data booklet, you'll notice that H2SO4 is a strong acid, and that's because the Ka for this first step is large it's completely ionized in that first step. But if you look up HSO4 minus, you'll notice that its Ka value is about 0 0.012, 1.2 times 10 to the minus 2. And so the HSO4 minus is considered a weak acid rather than a strong one. It only dissociates partially in the second step. 
So you'd get a complete ionization for sulfuric acid's first step, and then a weak partial ionization for its second step. If you imagine, we, we, if you want to do this, you could pause the video and try this, or just skip this if you like. Um, phosphoric acid was H3PO4. So since it has three hydrogen ions, it's going to go through three successive steps in its ionization and in its dissociation. And each one of those steps will have a corresponding Ka expression. In the first step, H3PO4 will react with water. That'll produce some hydronium and its conjugate base H2PO4 minus. In the second step, H2PO4 minus will also react with water, producing more hydronium and its conjugate base, which would be HPO4 2 minus. And then in that third and final step, the HPO4 2 minus will react with water, producing more hydronium in the third step, and then the conjugate base phosphate PO4 3 minus. So notice the H3PO4 becomes H2PO4 minus, then HPO4 2 minus, and finally PO4 3 minus in the final step. Polyprotic acids will have Ka1s, Ka2s if they're diprotic, and if they're triprotic, they'll have a Ka3 as well. So ascorbic acid is, found in, is also known as vitamin C. Its first Ka value is 8 times 10 to the minus 5, so it's a pretty weak first ionization. And its second ionization is way, way weaker. It's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 12 for the Ka value. Carbonic acid is found in any, in any carbonated beverage, any kind of soft drink. The first Ka value is very small, 4.3 times 10 to the minus 7 for the first step in its ionization. Its second step is very much weaker again, 5.6 times 10 to the minus 11. Citric acid has three steps in its ionization, all three of which again are weak. The only one which shows a large ionization is sulfuric acid, as we discussed earlier, where the first step is completely ionized and the second step is only partly ionized. Notice, though, that in almost every case, the second and, if there is one, the third Ka values are generally much, much smaller than the first. There is at least one exception on this list, but um, generally speaking, the second or third steps have much smaller Ka's. That's going to be important mathematically because it means that we'll generally ignore the second or third steps in, in calculations because they produce so little hydronium compared to the first step of the ionization. Now we've already hinted at this when we discussed uh, sulfuric acid a minute ago. Amphoteric substances, this is important vocabulary, an amphoteric substance is one where it can behave as both an acid and a base. So when it depends what it reacts with, but amphoteric substances have both acidic and basic properties. The most common example of an amphoteric substance that we'll encounter is water. If you dissolve an acid in the water, so for in this example we've got nitric acid, HNO3, dissolved in water, the nitric acid will force the water molecules to accept hydrogen ions. So the H2O becomes H3O positive, and the water here is behaving as a base, a Bronsted-Lowry base. On the other hand, if you put into the water a base, and this time we're using a very common base, ammonia, NH3, it's a weak base, when it dissolves in water, the ammonia will end up accepting a hydrogen ion from the water molecules. So this time the water, instead of um, accepting hydrogens, they give away hydrogen ions. The water then becomes the hydroxide ion OH-. So in the first reaction, water is accepting hydrogen from an acid, so water there behaves as a base. In the second reaction, the water is giving away a hydrogen ion to the ammonia, so the water there is behaving as an acid. 
So water will behave as a base or an acid. Water is amphoteric. To be amphoteric, a substance must be able to be an acid. That means it has to have hydrogen ions in its formula to donate. Water is a little unusual in that it was a neutral molecule to begin with. Most amphoteric substances are actually going to be negatively charged, and it's the negative charge which will, which will attract hydrogen ions to begin with. So most amphoteric substances will have hydrogen ions and be negatively charged. Some common examples of that would be the bicarbonate ion, HCO3 minus. Notice it has hydrogens that it can give away, and it's negatively charged, so therefore it will also attract hydrogen ions. The dihydrogen phosphate, H2PO4 minus, has two hydrogen ions that it could give away and is also negatively charged. So amphoteric substances usually negatively charged and with hydrogen ions. The one common exception to that is water. Water is a neutral molecule um, and has hydrogen ions to donate. All the way back to elementary school, you've heard about pH, the pH scale. We know that acids will produce hydrogen ions in water. Those hydrogen ions are donated to water molecules, which become the hydronium ions. The concentration of the hydronium ions in the solution would therefore be a measurement of the solution's acidity. However, if you're not talking to another chemistry student, um, someone with some knowledge of chemistry, it really wouldn't make much sense to start discussing the molarity of hydronium ions in a solution to describe acidity. That person would have no clue what you meant. Another problem with using molarity of hydronium is that in solutions, it can vary hugely. You might have a solution with pH 12 where the concentration of hydronium at 25 degrees Celsius is 10 to the minus 12 molarity. Imagine how small a number that is. 1 times 10 to the minus 12 molarity would be the hydronium concentration. On the other hand, pure water at 25 degrees Celsius would have 1 times 10 to the minus 7 molarity hydronium. Still a very tiny number, but about... Oh, what is that, about 10,000 times, sorry, about 100,000 times larger than the solution we mentioned at pH 12. Similarly, if you take an acid solution like pH 1, its hydronium would be 10 to the minus 1 molarity, 0.1. So the concentration of hydronium can vary hugely among acid solutions. What we'd like is a, is a measurement of acidity which doesn't have such a wide range of values, and that's where pH comes in pH is defined mathematically in terms of the hydronium concentration. Now, if you've never studied logarithms in pre-calculus math, this is not going to mean a whole lot to you. pH, and notice how we write it, a lowercase p and an uppercase h. The uppercase h stands for hydrogen ions. The lowercase p is a math function which means take the negative logarithm of something. So negative log, negative logarithm of the hydronium concentration is the definition of pH. Now if you are a pre-calculus math student, imagine taking the negative sign in that equation, moving it to the other side, so negative pH equals the log of hydronium, then switching from the logarithmic equation back to its exponential form, you'd get the equation in red. The concentration of hydronium in a solution is equal to 10 to the power of negative pH. Both of those equations are really the same equation, just written in different ways, but you should know them both pH, if you know the hydronium concentration, negative log of that concentration. If you have the pH value, 10 to the power of negative pH will give you the hydronium concentration. Now if you have your calculator with you, take it out, find the logarithm button, L-O-G, 
And notice right above the logarithm button, it says 10 to the power of x. So 10 to the power of x is the inverse function of logarithms, and that's why it's written above the button on the calculator as a second function. Try this on your calculator. If the hydronium concentration in a solution is 0 0.010 molarity, show with your calculator that the pH of that solution must be 2. To do that, take your calculator, type in negative log, the LOG button, and then 0 0.010 and enter. Your calculator should tell you 2 is the pH value. Now, a word about significant digits. Notice that in the concentration, there were two significant digits, 0 0.010. The leading zeros at the beginning of that are not significant, but the one zero at the end are significant digits. In the pH value, we kept two decimal values, two, de sorry, two decimal places. Only the decimal points in a pH are considered significant. So if you needed two significant digits in a pH value, you should always keep two decimal places. Here's one with a slightly more awkward concentration of hydronium, 2.5 times 10 to the minus 5 molarity. Let's grab your calculator and verify that the pH of that solution is 4.60. Be sure when entering the concentration on your calculator, you use the scientific notation button 2.5 EE or 2.5 EXP, depending on which calculator you have, negative 5. Okay? That's how you should be typing the scientific notation button on your calculator. So negative log 2.5 times 10 to the minus 5 will equal 4.60. Working backwards, if you know the pH of a solution is 8, notice from the equation that the hydronium concentration must equal 10 to the power of negative 8. So even without a calculator, we could just write 1.0 times 10 to the negative 8 molarity. If the pH were some other more awkward number, like 3.25, we could say that the hydronium concentration, using the red equation, is 10 to the power of negative 3.25. Grabbing your calculator, you would type second function logarithm. That will take you to the 10 to the power of feature of the calculator. So second function logarithm, and then negative 3.25, to get the answer that the hydronium is 5.6 times 10 to the minus 4 molarity. Again, notice that the pH there had two decimal places, so I'm keeping two significant digits in my concentration of hydronium. The pH scale has, is usually represented as numbers ranging from 1 or sometimes 0 up to 14. But in fact, it has no beginning and no end. pHs can be negative, pHs can be above 14. But most substances that you would encounter in everyday life are going to have pH values between 0 and 14, which is why many students are, are shown that kind of scale. On, on this example of a pH scale, notice that the acids, as we discussed at the beginning of the unit, are generally things that you would eat or drink, not always, you're not going to go and drink battery acid, but lemon juice, vinegar, wine, tomatoes, coffee, milk, those are all, all acidic solutions. Bases are generally often things that you might clean with, so borax, um, milk of magnesia is, is actually a medication to, to combat uh, acid reflux. Detergents, ammonia, bleach, those are things you would clean with. Put sodium hydroxide at the end is commonly found as well in many household cleaners. When deciding if a solution is acidic, basic, or neutral, if you have a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius, you can use the concentrations on the side of this graph to decide the acidic, basic, or neutral nature of a solution. A neutral solution will have hydronium and hydroxide concentrations 1 times 10 to the minus 7 molarity at 25 degrees Celsius. 
an acid solution has a hydronium concentration larger than that and the hydroxide concentration less than that. In a basic solution, it's the reverse. The hydronium concentration is less than 10 to the minus 7, and the hydroxide is greater than 10 to the minus 7. The key, though, there is that those numbers are only true at 25 degrees Celsius. If you erase the numbers, you can make something which is more generally true. You could say that generally, an acid solution will have a greater hydronium concentration than the hydroxide. If the two are equal, no matter what the concentrations are, if they are equal, the solution will be neutral. And if the hydroxide is greater than the hydronium, the solution will be basic. Pure water, 25 degrees Celsius, has a pH of 7. So in a pure water solution, there, sorry, in pure water, there must be some hydronium present. So the question is, where does it come from if it's pure water? Well, collision theory tells us that the water particles are constantly colliding with each other. And we've already discussed how water is amphoteric. Water molecules can, can sometimes give hydrogens and sometimes accept them. In a pure water, in a, in a beaker or test tube glass of water, a very, very tiny fraction of the water molecules will undergo acid-base reactions with each other. So we call it the self-ionization or the auto-ionization of water. And this happens in any aqueous solution where water is present. So one water molecule collides with another and donates hydrogen ions. So one of the two water molecules behaves as an acid, producing hydronium, and the other acts as a base, giving us hydroxide. So you get hydronium and hydroxide in a one-to-one -one ratio. That's why pure water, no matter what the temperature, is going to be a neutral because there's equal amounts of hydronium and hydroxide in the water. Now in this reaction, the water molecules would be liquids, and the hydronium and the hydroxide would be aqueous. We can write an equilibrium expression for the reaction. The equilibrium constant for this re ex expression will have a special symbol. We'll call it Kw, the W to represent the ionization of water. At 25 degrees Celsius, the Kw is very, very tiny, 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. And if you look at the reaction, leaving out the liquid waters on the left, you'd get that the fact that Kw is equal to the hydronium concentration times the hydroxide concentration. Notice that if you know one of those two concentrations, you could use this simple equation to find the other. We could, if we wanted, set up a simple ice table where we write the equation above, H2O plus H2O makes hydronium and hydroxide. We would put X's underneath the water molecules because they're liquids. We wouldn't care about them in the ice table. The hydronium and hydroxide would start off at zero concentrations in the ice table. And then they would both increase by equal amounts, which we'd call X. So you'd put a plus X and a plus X under the hydronium and hydroxide. That means at equilibrium, we could say there'd be X for each of them. Putting those X's into the KW expression down below would lead to 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14 equals X squared. And then square rooting, we'd find that X, which is the hydronium and the hydroxide concentration, is the square root of 10 to the minus 14, which would be 1 times 10 to the minus 7 molarity. That would lead to a pH of 7 and a pOH of 7 also, where pH was defined as the negative log of hydronium, the pOH is the negative log of the hydroxide concentration. So the pH and pOH of pure water at 25 degrees Celsius is equal to 7. Now, if you are familiar with, um, sorry, before I go on, here's just the, 
reaction we were just describing shown in pictures. You don't really need to sketch it. There's water reacting with water, producing hydronium and hydroxide ions. As I was saying, if you're familiar with logarithms from a pre-calculus math class, this next slide will make sense and you can copy it down. If you're not familiar with logarithms, then you might want to just write down the final equation that I'm going to produce here. I'm going to start with the KW expression that we just wrote down. KW is 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14 at 25 degrees Celsius. That's the KW constant for the self-ionization of water. That's equal to hydronium times hydroxide concentrations. And then we're going to do something a little peculiar. We're going to take the negative logarithm of both sides of this equation. And at first, that looks kind of scary, looks kind of more complicated. But if you grab a calculator and take the negative log of 1 times 10 to the minus 14, you'll see that that equals 14.00. And on the right, the negative log of hydronium times hydroxide, we can apply a rule from logarithms that says the logarithm of a product is the sum of the logarithms. So 14.00 is negative log of hydronium plus the negative log of hydroxide. And then looking carefully at that right-hand side, we realize we have an aha moment that the negative log of hydronium, that's the definition of pH. And the negative log of hydroxide is the definition of pOH. So we get this very important equation, which is really the same as the KW equation, but with some logarithms playing with it. So 14.00 equals pH plus pOH. Since the KW gave us 14.00, this equation again is only true at 25 degrees Celsius. Notice that if you know the pH, you can then find the pOH and vice versa. If a pH is 10, the pOH would be 4, since 10 plus 4 is 14. So those four quantities, the hydronium, the pH, the hydroxide concentration, and the pOH, they're linked together. When you have a neutral solution, your hydronium concentration and your hydroxide concentration are equal, 1 times 10 to the minus 7 molarity at 25 degrees, and the pH and pOH are equal, and they're both equal to 7 at 25 degrees. In acid solutions, the pH goes down and the pOH goes up. The hydronium concentration goes up and the hydroxide concentration goes down. If you think about the KW expression, KW was equal to hydronium times hydroxide, that implies mathematically that there's an inverse relationship between the hydronium and hydroxide concentrations. So when the hydronium drops in concentration, the hydroxide goes up by an equal factor. Now notice something else before we leave this slide. Take a look at pH 7 right here and compare it to pH 6 down below it. Notice that when there's a one unit difference in pH, the hydronium concentration differs by a factor of 10. And in fact, when the pH dropped from 7 to 6, the hydronium increased by a factor of 10. On the other hand, if your pH goes up from 6 to 7, the hydronium concentration will go down by a factor of 10. So every unit on the pH scale represents a factor of 10 in hydronium. If your pH were to go from 8 up to 10, that's an increase in pH by 2 units, then the hydronium concentration is going to drop not by 10, but this time by a factor of 100, 10 times 10. If the pH were to go up by 3 units, the hydronium would go down by 10 times 10 times 10 by 1,000 times. Similarly, pOH and hydroxide are related in the same way. When your pOH goes up, your hydroxide concentration goes down with every unit of pOH representing a factor of 10 
in the hydroxide concentration. Two units pOH would be a hundred times difference, three units would be a thousand times difference, etc. So we're about to apply these six basic equations, these six introductory equations that we've seen in the acid-base unit so far. We have, there are really three equations with parallel forms of each one. The definition of pH was the negative log of the hydronium concentration. If you rearrange that equation, you get the fact that hydronium concentration is 10 to the power of negative pH. Be sure you're using the second function logarithm on your calculator to access 10 to the power of. Similarly, pOH is the negative logarithm of hydroxide concentration, and corresponding to that, the hydroxide concentration in a solution is 10 to the power of negative pOH. The Kw was 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14, that's the equilibrium constant for water's self-ionization, and that's equal to hydronium concentration times hydroxide. If you apply logarithms to that, you can show that 14.00 will equal pH plus pOH. So with those six equations, pause and write them down again if you haven't done so. We're going to apply them to a simple table where you're going to fill in some missing information. So copy this table down and leave space in each missing cell for you to show some work. You don't want to just put an answer down, you want to show some work. So if in the first line of the table we're given the hydronium concentration of a solution, if we know the hydronium, we can find all three of the other quantities. We can find the hydroxide, the pH, and the pOH. If you stop and think about those six equations, you notice right away that if you know the hydronium, you could use the Kw expression, if you want, to go find the hydroxide concentration. Or you could use the definition of pH to get the pH value. Once you know the pH, finding the pOH is just a matter of subtracting from 14. Or, taking the hydroxide, you could find the pOH by taking 10 to the power, uh, sorry, by taking negative logarithm, rather, of the hydroxide concentration. So there's more than one way to get some of the missing information. In the boxes, show your work so that you can study from this later and pay attention to significant digits. When you're ready, uh, continue. I'm going to pause the video here. When you're ready, um, click play and that'll take you to the answers to check your work. So pause the video before you go on.